Okay, welcome everyone to today's colloquium. Professor Gates is unable to be here in person, but he is watching us through Zoom. He's on his way to deliver some lectures at Baylor University in, in Texas. And we're excited to have Suraj present his um, fellow's colloquium talk. And we're also very excited to welcome Erica Licht, who will be providing the formal introduction. Let me just say that Erica Licht has been engaged in racial equality and organizational change research and training for over 15 years. She is currently research projects director at the Institutional Anti-Racism and Accountability Project here at Harvard. Um, a Fulbright Scholar, Erica Licht holds a Master's in Public Administration from the Kennedy School and a Master's in Justice Policy from the London School of Economics. She has taught classes on justice reform at the University of West Indies, Mona, and on adaptive leadership at the, at, at the Kennedy School. And she currently co-hosts the podcast, Untying Knots. Please welcome Erica Licht. Thank you, and happy to be here with all of you. So in the film Origin, Ava DuVernay, the director and creator of a beautiful, gorgeous adaptation of Isabel Wilkerson's work, Cast, The Origins of Our Discontents, uh, Wilkerson herself is played by Anjani Ellis Taylor. And she lands in India, and we see a bright, smiling face appear on the screen that says, Isabel, welcome to India. That smiling face is the same face that I met about seven years ago here on campus. And Dr. Siraj Yende, for those of you who haven't seen the film yet, Origin, which is a must, Dr. Siraj Yende plays Dr. Siraj Yende. <laughs> the only one in the film. Um, self-cast. So what's remarkable, not just about the self-acting that we saw in the film, is that Siraj's own work over the last two uh, decades, several decades, to advocate, analyze, and promote critical analysis of how caste functions in Indian society, but also its ripple effects and repercussions for the world. This is both for the Indian diaspora as well as for other oppressed and marginalized people. And so for me, it's the shared humanity in his work, the web of shared humanity that's so resilient. It's like a spider's web. It's delicate, it's soft, you have to look for nuance, it's ro yet it's robust. It's strong, it's ready to catch disinformation, misinformation, and any oppressive isms or systems uh, wherever in its web. When cast matters, came out uh, in 2019, I was immediately struck by the attempt to mirror Dr. Cornell West's own work, um, of course, Race Matters, which was a tremendous feat. Yet, of course, it manages not only to hold its own, but to provide one of the pioneering looks at not only how caste matters, but again, the continued effects to manifest with the potential to affect generations to come. For myself, watching the film, Origin, and knowing Siraj and his work, and Wilkerson's, as a Jewish person, I saw myself and my family members in the concentration camps reflected on screen. Their humanity, the raw bitterness of humanity, the vitriol, the supremacist ideology that creates what was right there in front of us displayed. And I think one of the, the biggest lessons I've taken from Siraj is the reckoning needed with both that oppressive ideology, but especially what it does to us as human beings. Malcolm X said, who taught you to hate the texture of your hair? Who taught you to hate the color of your skin? Who taught you to hate the shape of your nose and the shape of your lips? Who taught you to hate yourself from the top of your head to the soles of your feet? And as Siraj says, for a Dalit person, that means waking up every morning believing that you're not good enough, that your life is not good enough, that it's not worth it. The same for me in cases as a Jewish person and for anyone who has a marginalized or oppressed identity. But we're here today because both the Hutchins Center and Siraj and his work tell us a different story. And it's a story that Wilkerson and DuVernay have given us the tools and the means to know what to do with it. 
Dr. Siraj Yende is completing his doctorate at the Faculty of History, University of Oxford. Um, in addition to Cast Matters, he's the co-editor of the award-winning anthology, The Radical and Ambedkar Critical Reflections. He's a finalist for India's highest literary award, and um, his books have been translated into many languages. He's written over 170 articles and reviews that have appeared in publications, including um, Economic and Political Weekly, Ethnic and Racial Studies, among many others. He's a columnist at the Indian Express, and I'd say finds time to dress very nicely as well. Um, he's currently working on two manuscripts, um, which we're excited to see in the years to come, and he's the founder and curator of the Dalit Film Festival um, here in the Boston area. It's now my sincere pleasure to welcome to the podium Dr. Siraj Yandit. Thank you so much. I don't think I've had such a generous introduction in many, many years. So thank you, Erica. I, at the outset, would like to um, sincerely express my gratitude to two of my mentors and guardians here on campus. One was here, no longer here. First is Professor Gates, um, who took me under his wings many, many years ago uh, when I was uh, fresh graduate student and I, I went to seek his audience and I think it was 2017 and he inquired about me and the compassion he demonstrated, the first question he asked me, how are am I keeping up myself, how is it? And he asked me, do you have a, do you have a, do you have a place to stay and how is your situation housing? And I explained to him, no, I'm, I just came to discuss ideas about my next book. But he said, what will it take for you to work on the book? I had no idea about the book. He said, finish the damn book. And he gave me a, a partial <laughs> fellowship. Um, and that was the first time when I had an introduction to the Du Bois Institute. And then again this year, um, he asked me to come here and, and complete my next book. So the first book, uh, Cast Matters, really came out of the work that I was doing here on campus and, 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 and beyond. I would also like to thank Professor Cornell West, uh, who also took me under his wings and offered his mentorship whenever I need it. Uh, and he still continues to do. So this both Professor Gates, Professor Connell West, thank you so much. And also for your classes on Du Bois. I learned about Du Bois a lot over many years that I was attending Harvard since 2015. And that's when I got the uh, grip of. So today something I'll present. Uh, this is, uh, you, know, you know, since we have less time and also uh, this is part of a larger project, of course, you know. And so there's many information that is trimmed, uh, but, but you will see that in the final edition of the book. Um, I would also like to thank the staff here, Krishna, Abby, Sean, and other colleagues here for helping us and my beautiful fellows here. It was great hanging out and hope to connect for the rest of our lives. Um, and also to my friends uh, who have come outside, from outside the Hutchins Center from Harvard and beyond you know, in Boston area. Thank you, Tasha, my partner is here as well. Thank you, everybody. Uh, so what is the, the lethality in this? <clears throat> Usually we look at uh, construction of nationhood uh, and, and space and spacious masses really confine our imagination of what it means to lead any form of struggles. And one of that aspect was about geography, the struggles of colonial post-colonialism. Geography as a marker of national identity has worked to the advantage of the dominant groups who define it. The fields of modernism, postmodernism, culture, and literary analysis of the third world or the post-colonial world all posited an unclear agenda regarding the outcasts. These fields of inquiry were preoccupied with the supposed nationalist narrative in the context of new global politics of the past century, which is post-colonialism. The nationalist narratives were a position of dominant groups controlled by national majorities who advanced their cause of occlusion of non-elites from the examinations of their own societies. Thus, the lethality has an axis, but not angles and stretches. It circles like a top standing on the firm foundation of revolving multipolarities. This was the objective behind portending a synthesis of different object worlds, not confined to monohegemony of either caste or subcaste groups. It is an intended phobia against the thoughts of dominance and control. But it is also a space of local bazaar that would capture them all and defy norms of caste civility. 
The lethality is a shape of alterity that shifts the focus from hegemonic oppressive tomes and instead looks inward as a possible universal project. The lethality is an evolving synthesis that is taking ahead various forms of pluralities through historical debrahminization and modern coloniality. It is a shape of global decoloniality. The lethality is a native praxis that is not nativist in experimentation but globalist in formation. We understand the world through simplistic narratives of explanations. The complexity is for the occult and the saint walking on the path of Nibbana, the ultimate freedom. The unexplained has to be poetically put down for many generations to interpret. Words exiled from the dominion of simplicity form a nation in the minds of greatness. Such vocabularies define the future. Their logics are grammarian and telos are care. Would a person belong to the world of injustice when their birth and lineage are contesting for justice and compassion for all? The preface of one's measured liberty is to care for all than others. The lethality co-creates the meanings of dualisms. It is not an absence of non-duality. I'm skipping Du Bois's introduction for this audience, certainly. Uh, I'll, I'll go right into his thesis of Du Bois's trajectory as a black modernist who viewed people's humanity with genres of music, sociology, literary sphere, make him a unique representative of the colored word, predominantly situated in America, with influences crossing over to Africa, Europe, even South Asia. Du Bois's writing helped us to argue for black modernity, surpassing ethnocentric account of modern black history and politics. Du Bois's faith in the dogma as well as skepticism towards the ideology of progress and culture created a radical axis of relationship mingling the domestic with national and transnationalism. He became in, identified with many political identities throughout his life. Fabian socialist, communist, Marxist, a committed and self-declared socialist, he identified himself. Du Bois, much like Ambedkar, was experimenting with available methods to fight for the rights of his people. Both were trained in economics and had developed profound interest in labor and worker rights. In a different socio-political context and a geography far removed from the Africana world, Africana as we know, it's not just Africa but the diasporic African presence, B.R. Ambedkar, an untouchable caste scholar, rallied against the edifice of caste. Looking at Ambedkar through the posthumous international careers of Du Bois and Fanon, one finds uninterested treatment accorded to Ambedkar's scholarship and its unequal dissemination in the post-colonial, post, post world of art and letters. This has to do with Ambedkar's disinterest in centering the Western episteme as a subject of inquiry. Ambedkar was concerned about the problems of a nation that were internalized, that took him away from the colonial, post-colonial debates that were projected as internationalist, and thereby reducing Ambedkar as a local polemicist. For Ambedkar, imperialism, and I quote, did offer some scope for the advancement of the Indian people, end quote. He was not alone in sharing this viewpoint. Ambedkar was not shy in declaring his views about imperialism, which could be at times viewed as narrowly located in the altars of nationalism, thereby adducing his politics to a local charter. Ambedkar refined the proposal of imperialism. Imperialism did not hold the monopoly on oppression and exploitation. During the height of his working class activism, he was the founder of India's first Labour Party, Independent Labour Party, in 1936. But his speech he gave in 1938, Ambedkar explained that the departure of British from India would not solve the problems of Indian because, and I quote him, the landlords, the mill owners, the money lenders will remain in India, end quote. They were a source of imperial imagination in the form of capitalism. Ambedkar underscored capitalism and imperialism as the edges of power that did not differentiate oppression of the natives. The chronograph on his wrist wrapped the badges of millennia long memory of subjugation. Ambedkar equated imperialism with capitalism from the perspective of an exploited native. In a state of caste expansionism, Ambedkar could not waste time in only refuting imperialism as a singular idiosyncratic fetish. Who then is Ambedkar? Um, Ambedkar has many laurels to his, his CV. You know, he was um, he was the first untouchable to graduate matriculation with the tenth grade, and then you know he got a scholarship to to come to Colombia 
came to Colombia in 1913, again first untouchable to graduate out of uh, Colombia, uh, outside India. And, and of course, uh, you know, he, he had two doctorates, uh, one in economics and another in finance. Um, well, the, f the second was in London School of Economics. Uh, you know, he led India's uh, untouchable civil rights movement. Um, his writings, as we'll see, span in 25 volumes and more are counting. Um, <clears throat> primary, I mean, you know, one of his contributions to India was to frame India's constitution. And eventually, he relinquished Hinduism that treated him inferior. Uh, and, 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 and that's why he adopted Buddhism with his followers of nearly 300,000. Uh, he also started four newspapers. One of them was under his leadership. That makes it five. And those, are the, and those were written in Marathi language, which is spoken nearly about 120 million people now uh, in, in India. And those were some of the writings that we have uh, of it. And you know, one can see the near parallels with Du Bois's of the way Du Bois' writings span as well. Um, some of the topics he dealt with or slavery and untouchability. He, he wrote about caste in India. He wrote about nation, nation formation. He wrote about the new foundation of Pakistan, what it meant. He wrote about Pakistan before Pakistan was formed. He wrote also on Buddha and Karl Marx, comparing the Karl Marx in ideology with the Buddhist metaphysics of liberation. He wrote on philosophy of Hinduism. And, 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 and the writings continue, as I said, 25 plus. Du Bois and Fenon have received the deserving credit uh, by their followers who raised a canon in their name and established a knowledge enterprise of their intellectual thought. Yet there are qualified lamentations from the hearts of Du Boisians and Fenonians. In a foreword to her book, to the book What Fenon Said, Sonia Diane Hersburn uh, bemoans the fact that Fenon's original thought is not taken into consideration, while if at all he is taken into account. Fenon has to adjust alongside Che Guevara. And she says, because Fenon ignites, and her word, violent passion, end quote, so does Che Guevara. However, Fenon's career doesn't get the same attention as happens with Che Guevara. Ambedkar doesn't get the same recognition either, let alone attention for theorizing the original caste experience by mixing disciplinary genres and philosophical inquiries. Fenon does the same in a different form by getting quote, getting rid of ready-made discourse and writing fresh ideas with genuine investment of the condition of the oppressed humanity. Ambedkar's concern about the fragile and rejected population forced him to wrestle with the titans of knowledge and scholars of caste regulations. Comparatively, Ambedkar did not receive similar international reputation after his death, as was the case with Du Bois and Fenon. The later two offered an enthusiastic appeal to their people, the dark-skinned condemned masses of the world. However, for Dalits, their humanity and experiences were theorized and mostly mischaracterized by India's dominant caste scholars, who became the leaders of post-colonialism. They found an appeal in the black program. These scholars were mostly left-leaning lovers of Fanon and Du Bois. In introspection, these lovers appear disloyal to the project of Du Bois and Fanonism. By advantaging their, their self, and this is basically drawing from Professor Gates's work, uh, by advantaging their self as a privileged victim of colonialism, Fenon's indictment was misrepresented in the service of abstract working class in India. The same lovers were single-handedly responsible for suppressing the voices of the wretched of the earth from their own geographies. That is why instead of centering Ambedkar, they preferred to find an ideal in Fenon and Du Bois far removed from their experiences and geographies. If Sonia Dayan Hesburn's lamentations about Fanon's belated appreciation is fan is considered, one has many clauses to groan about the mistreatment according to Ambedkar's oath. Race and caste have maintained sustained interest in the discipline of anthropology and its many set political anthropology, cultural anthropology, social anthropology, and so forth. Caste was initially understood as a totemic organization. This interpretation can be seen in the early writings of colonial administrators and European researchers who describe caste as a system that operated in the modern science of the clan system. Given the complex nature of caste to European researchers, where caste was compared to the old European states, you know, the French uh, revolution, the French notion of revolution also carried with the idea of states that had recognized hierarchy and aristocracy, the researchers nevertheless applied a racial logic with contentious interpretations to study Indian caste problem. 
The anthropometric interest of the British ethnographer Herbert Risley, for example, engaged with the fact of identifying the racial logic of caste. On the other hand, working with Sanskrit translations of Indian ancient text, philologist of German origin Max Müller noted that caste and its validity came from the Hindu scriptures. Sanskritists who had a different view, John Muir observed that the belief in the origin of Varnas, i.e. the primeval Brahma, did not exist in ancient times, which was alteration, which is now getting proved. So the whole idea of it being the oldest system and the idea of uh, uh, the, the Vedas and how caste system was figured about 5,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, get contested as we engage with the text, with the liturgy of the published material. It was, after, it was in the after years of antiquity that Varnas, i.e. color, became identified with the hierarchy of supreme human. However, reporting from a perspective of the experienced subject, Ambedkar took upon himself to locate the origin and genesis of caste. He refuted predominated theories proposed by various disciplines and scholars of the field from the European descent to offer a perspective that suited the Indic slash narrative, in native narrative. In his 1916 essay, Caste in India, Ambedkar chose to engage with the existing studies of caste. His sub first subject of inquiry was Sir Herbert Hope Risley. Risley's detailed work argued for the racial component among Indian population. For example, he identified Chamars, the North Indian uh, untouchables, from the list of racial ancestry. Risley's interest in tribe and caste rested with understanding physical contrast among Indians. In short, Risley was interested in the racial theory of caste. He was influenced by the 19th century French anthropologist Paul Topinard, who proposed different techniques of identifying ethnic components among diverse groups and tribes of colonized nation. Now, Topinard was interested in proving the social Darwinist nature of white European male character. And we know how 19th century was invested in identifying science with the idea of color and race. He was influenced again by Paul Broca, a Frenchman again, who was heavily invested in devising physical traits of anthropology and cognition regarding different races of humankind. Max Muller, one of the early proponents of Aryan theory, placed emphasis on the linguistic variables to find differences. He identified two groups who populated the European and Indian landscape in India, the North Aryans and the South Aryans. North Aryans, he argued, were invested in finding the political sense of their being, while South Aryans went about wondering for religion and philosophy. Mueller placed emphasis on the religious determinism. Ambedkar refuted the argument by claiming that the Aryan religiosity was just, I quote him, a series of observances without any spiritual content, end quote. So that kind of refused the idea of how this religiosity was formed. Mueller claimed that fair-skinned Indo-European Aryans conquered the dark-skinned Dasas, the slaves of India. While caste was circulated in the European world, German intellectual tradition elaborated on this by exteriorizing caste to the Indic society. Max Weber saw caste as foundational to the Hindu religious codes. Weber observed caste, Weber's observation of caste was that it was a lifeline to Hinduism without which there existed no Hinduism. Weber further went on to argue that caste comprised what was ritual law. And we have to look at these terms in the anthropological study that were studied in Africa and, and other parts of Latin America, where rituality was, was considered as a sacrosanct practice of backwardness. These conversations in Europe were influential as they established a story of the ancient Eastern world that was mysterious and complex. The above three phases help us to locate the supposition of caste in Western notions. And where did this come from? Frenchman Louis Dumont, who wrote a book on caste, argues that many of the people who were collecting data were from the aristocratic background, and thus they had aristocratic influences. Additionally, among the early phases of documentation of caste and tribes in India, it is conspicuously clear that bureaucratic records such as census did play an important role in signifying caste dynamics. Whatever we think about today's multiple caste was in 1861 onwards caste census. Risley again was influential in recording the census. Drawing from his anthropometric theory, Risley identified seven distinct groups constituting India, and they were as follows Mongoloids, Indo Aryans, Mongolo Dravidians, Aryo Dravidians, Sitho Dravidians, Turco Iranians. And this is just an arbitrary makeup. And this is how I mean, the map he created. I mean, uh, 
he created regions with titles of the caste. So the, according to him, these was occupied by Brahmins, this occupied by Gorns, Kappus. Although this is a very um, non-representative of the population because Brahmins are not that many percentage in India anyway. And, and, and the notion of Brahman here, Brahman here gives the idea that the population that they were hanging out were mostly Brahmin. And that's how that influenced their own understanding of, of, of India's anthropometric study. This is how the racial component was integrated to define racial caste in India. Apart from this, the census record placed diverse castes as special categories. The census of India embarked on a project to classify different ethnic and racial groups. Ambedkar credits the census for splitting diverse groups into caste and tribe. Now, it provided a bureaucratic arrangement to regulate and govern. Taking from this, one can ask, what are the complementary modes of identification that can relate to the suppressed races and castes? How can the formula of darker races fit into India's caste narrative? And what is it that the caste Indian and African American, black African could achieve together? Those questions go beyond the moment of historicism, which is the epochal development history writing, and refines the challenges that lay in the futuristic ideals of hermeneutics. As hermeneutics get to be rewritten and reinterpreted, its importance surpasses historical necessity to forming vanguardism for the future. The early intervention of caste scholarship plays caste within Aryan slash color narrative of native society. However, as we see in the later years of Richards, it was not that simple caste was like race a societal figuration of its own sub-identities. Sometimes they featured as one and the same thing and at times they figured as subdivision of the other. In many instances, race was understood differently than what it is understood today. Michael Harney, a medieval era historian who studies Iberia, records the moving categorizations of race from biblical era to Iberia. The meaning of it changed from being a tribe, nation, clan and people. Iberia excluded, created the idea of rasa or casta to exclude two prominent groups which was religiously oriented. One was the Jews and other was the Moors. He argues that caste was understood, quote, as internalized racialization, end quote. That does not establish segregation but difference. This, and I quote him, this may or may not translate into structures and practices of outright dominance and subalternity, end quote. This explanation is era specific and speculative. However, it suggests that the mythical fiction of race was categorized into castes and it required justification which caste provided as a rationale for subdivision and hierarchy. Du Bois and Laboratory of Caste, Color and, and Class. The efficacy of Indian and African histories need to be anchored into the traditions of Dafricanism. I mean, this is Professor Gates's word. He just called once, I was wearing my Afro, he said, this is Dafro, it's not Afro. And I thought, this is a great concept, let me develop on that. The archives of the subordinated need to be brought into focus that have been obviated in the hierarchy of memorialization and provenance given to be written recorded work. We should turn to the theories of race that engage with political categories of black and white. Race is increasingly becoming an important identifier to realize one's belonging to the diverse colorful world. I propose looking at the societies that were at the forefront of leading the battles against caste and race in the 20th century. My aim is to explore the formation of coalition camps of the oppressed in the world of Du Bois, Ambedkar and Feno. Feno is part of, as much as Steve Biko is part of my work, but today we are just focusing on Du Bois' uh, 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 canon here. For this to happen, we need to understand that the past century's problems have now surpassed the orientalized colonial logic. The rulers of different empires had similar rule book that relied on dualisms. The first of capitalist mode of production and second promotion of unscientific racial antagonisms. The present era is confounded with social factors spilled over from the past century, albeit with a different directory. The issues are no longer in the binaries of colonial and colonized only but debated within the post-colonial national framework. This has brought about a change in the othering done through the apparent hierarchy of metropole as a center and colony as an orient. Now this has also shifted, where colony which was once an orient was also becoming a center. This gave opportunities for the colorized world to rise against imperialism and racism. Color was a fine line of distinction that was utilized to forge unity against white imperialism across geographies. Marcus Garvis's, for example, movement was one of his first kind 
what Nico Slate calls that put colored cosmopolitan lens on British imperialism that did not isolate British imperialism only to one geography. Du Bois's cast prognosis to the racial problem in America is mirrored in other post-slavery societies of the modern world. Du Bois started as a scholar trying to decode the prevalence of color caste in post-bellum American societies in his early years and sustained his thesis diligently. Though the term color caste features in Du Bois's writing early on, he brought forth the caste analysis to underscore the Negro problem in America. In 1930, Du Bois detailed color caste proposition in his essay, Color Caste in the United States. Du Bois is clear about the systemic importance that caste had assumed in the United States. For Du Bois, color caste is a theoretical explanation for the injunctions and prohibitions imposed on the free Negro population of the US. The black free men lived in dependent conditions. They couldn't marry the person of their choice, couldn't buy land in the South, were made to remain subordinated at jobs or in the unions, and were faced to compete with powerful businesses. In short, such prohibitions added to the exclusion from exercising their franchise. This was seen in trade or at job with lawyers, writers, artists, clergymen, among other vocations. Du Bois's attention to the concept of purity of blood to understand caste argued that though color discrimination might have decreased, but restrictions based on caste were still alive. What he meant was that caste correctly applied to the American society. The foundation of the United States of America produced two castes, and this is important. He said one, slave owning, and the other, enslaved. This analysis brought forth the organic capacity of immobility, continuation of social condition, marked class status, and color, and color distinctions. The continuity of slavery was brought forth with liberal institutions patronage. <coughs> In another of his stirring essay, Evolution of the Race Problem, which was originally presented at the National Negro Conference held in New York in 1909 and published under the Proceedings of National Negro uh, uh, Conference, this was the conference that gave, paved the path to formation of NAACP. Uh, in, the, uh, in, in this, Du Bois launched a serious historical inquiry into the character of the what he called Negro problem in America. Du Bois surpassed contemporary scientific limits of identifying race by investigating the status of permanent Negro subjugation. Race that was still determined as biopolitical was rejected by Du Bois. Jim Crow was a matter of policy and law, quote, surrounding facts of race, end quote. Du Bois's methodology was intensely historical that phrase cast in the evolutionary inventory of U.S.'s formation from, I quote him, 1750 and 1800s, where increasing numbers of laws began to form a peculiar and systematic slave code based on a distinct idea of social caste." End quote. Du Bois looked at caste concerning education that aptly distinguished the character of American division. We know many laws and case laws for access to education. Scholars have argued that caste worked for Du Bois to undermine the biopolitical theory which was used to explain race. Caste differed quote, from other models generated from Marxists, neo-Marxist critical race theory and other social theory traditions. This is by a scholar Pierce Clayton was looking at Du Bois's and views on education. This can be clearly seen in how Du Bois never gave up on caste analytical framework to examine the condition of black people from slavery to Jim Crow. Du Bois's historical writing confirms that caste was indeed a matter of life and death for black people in America. As a sincere sociologist would do, Du Bois explicated the many social problems and many phases of the same problem, that is his phrase. In 1909 conference hosted, the 1909 conference hosted distinguished scholars of the time, Edward Seligman, who was academic advisor of Ambedkar at Columbia, John Dewey, another of his mentor at Columbia, alongside Du Bois, Ida B. Wells Barnett, Oswald Garrison, and a host of noted scholars and activists concerned about the evil of race discrimination. It was hoped that the resolution passed at the conference would invite public support and change the mood of the public by, quote, becoming more and more a subject to daily interest to all classes of the American people, end quote. Now, you have to, you have to relate how the divisions are created, not within the colorized binaries, but within the idea of classes or two segmentations of caste. Now, Du Bois's work as a scholar of caste in America is not promoted or is not understood as much. And let's begin with this quote that he wrote in his thesis. The problem, I mean, this is, this is a great quote to even discuss for a seminar. It, it, it has so much loaded information. The problem of, of the past, so far as the black American was concerned, 
began with caste, which is a definite place preordained in custom, law and religion. Let's underline that, where all men of black blood must be thirst. To be sure, this caste idea as applied to blacks was no sudden. Full Goron conception for the enslavement of workers was an idea which America inherited from Europe and was not synonymous for many years with the enslavement of the blacks. We see what Europe was doing with the idea of caste in India, how it inherited the German intellectual tradition and this is where the reference comes from. Uh, for many years for the enslavement of the blacks, although blacks were the chief workers, main men came to the idea of exclusive black slavery by gradually enslaving the workers. The idea of the workers and slavery follows, which is the logic of caste, as was the world's long custom. It's not just American, world's long custom. And then gradually conceiving certain sorts of work and certain colors of men as necessarily connected. Caste 101, certain type of profession, certain type of color becomes identified with one and the same and therefore subjugation and the idea of hierarchy continues because this logic takes place. Du Bois had clear understanding of caste and its operation in America as a whole and American South in particular. He observed this institution as contrary to equality. The color line was used to divide and eventually quote dominate the Negro dominance who was arrested by the problem of caste. Du Bois acknowledged his work and his role and he writes in Dusk of Dawn as he, as he reminisces about his long life and I quote him. He, he acknowledges his work and his role in knowledge production as, I begin the quote, a main factor in revolutionizing the attitude of the American Negro towards caste, end quote, between 1910 to 1930s. This approach of the stinging hammer blows that Du Bois confidently stated made, quote, Negroes aware of themselves, confident of their personalities and determined in self-assertion, end quote. This was no exaggeration as Du Bois contended his personality, as he usually poetically put, was leadership solely of ideas. Du Bois saw caste was not a fully developed idea and yet it quote consciously and persistently pressed upon the nation end quote. What he meant was that America was yet to become a complete caste nation. America was preparing the future quote caste program that was going to be renewed. He was thinking through the new formations as we see Jim Crow was the idea that was reinventing caste as, as he experienced. This meant imposing various social limitations and legal injunctions the direction of the country was nearly veering towards it, was, was veering towards it. The primary locus of such an arrangement was to mentally deprive the black person an identity of self-fulfillment. It was, and this is important quote, to instill contempt and kill self-respect among the American Negro and um, uh, self-respect among the American Negro. Caste was therefore a new slavery of black men in America, Du Bois contended, which brought forth a perpetual martyrdom and this is a very important word again the perpetuity of this idea of being suppressed but not just suppressed killed and caste justifies this killing as a martyrdom a justification for the existence of caste system the perpetual martyrdom of people on the outcast the untouchables of society justified for the existence of caste system it was extremely difficult and unlivable for those whose life was marked as an outcast in caste society Another of Du Bois' landmark as the souls of black folk became an anthem for the American public, making him a leader of black Americans. In many ways, it deployed a wider canonical pre-configurations of polity and science. Gilroy, Paul Gilroy looks at this corpus of literature as a seriously self-conscious polyphonic form that has people speaking in dilemmas, obviously. Du Bois' opus starts with varying provocations, the 20th century as he clairvoyantly observed was going to be a problem of color line. Color line meant a separated identity grouped together as autonomous entities. Line was the fence, the barrier. A line represented two worlds. If Du Bois had to look beyond color line, then he would, as he said, easily sit across arm in arm with French novelist Balzac and Dumont and alongside Aristotle and Aurelius. Color line defined the limitation while non-color line demonstrated the life beyond the veil wedged between truth and life. Du Bois imagined and boisterously claimed for a life beyond color line where everyone would have chance to mitigate. But color line was not just about white or black. It concerned everyone. Herein lies the genius of Du Bois who proclaimed that this color line would redefine the contours and relations on earth. Colonization and post-colonization, Jim Crow, anti-caste movements or progressive no-war struggle student movement 
all had to take into account the ubiquity of color line in their struggles. The 20th century is emphasized to usher the dawning era of achievable and convergent resistance. In Souls, Du Bois uses various expressions to demonstrate the yet continuing lower position of black Americans. Du Bois uses the term servile, servile caste to demonstrate, quote, restrictions to rights and privileges, end quote. It was a flip to the high cultures and civilizations bred in modern cities of the South that retained a separate and unequal structure for black people. Servile caste was a representation of the continuing lower position that excluded black people from equal participation, though their indispensability was unquestionable. Here, the servile caste were those who were targeted by the law of land and custom. Du Bois' challenge faces the dominating dogma where economy plays minimal role bereft of political and social construction of servile caste. Du Bois always had class and materiality at the center of his analysis and the American society. The color line is not just a test of 16th and 17th century class exploitation, but it had the possibility to return, and this is his quote, to the caste of ancient days, end quote, as the inevitability, inevitability of communication and earth growing smaller and more accessible helped forge the solidarity between non-white nations, which is what happened in the solidarity. In another of Du Bois's landmark scholarly statements, Black Reconstruction, Du Bois charts a new volume in the analysis of caste and black condition in America. Combing through a range of state and organizational reports, such as those of KKK, and a host of scholarly literature on the reconstruction program, Du Bois concludes that the reconstruction program was a major disappointment. He said it's a splendid failure. The reconstruction failed because violence and inequality was carried in the essence of post-emancipation. The failure of the promise of post-slavery era loomed in the lives of black Americans. The nexus of criminality and lack of citizenship paved a path for disenfranchisement of the black people, which continues to happen today of those who are incarcerated. This produced a new condition of caste in America. Surprised as he was seeing the evolution of caste in America, he commented, caste was now revived in, in America, the modern civilized land. It was supposed to be a relic of barbarism and existent only in India. But it has grown up and has been carefully nurtured and put on a legal basis with religious and moral sanctions in the South. This is from the Black Reconstruction. Arguments of merely race segregation or separation were not enough. To, the present con to explain, to present the condition of black Americans. Because there was an added layer of economic exploitation, domination, and extended subordination. Domination here worked in law, police, schools, and courts. This eventually translated in proclaiming the inferiority of black and superiority of white. Thus, the upper and lowest caste status in America's color regime rationalized black-white hierarchy. This made the black American, quote, a caged human being driven into mental provincialism, end quote. Such a control on the mind of the black person contributed to creating, Du Bois says, an inferiority complex. Thus, the black man did not teach his children, quote, self-respect, Du Bois lamented. This was essentially a question of psychological morality that implicated black man in white America. One of the essential features of caste laws is that it conditions the lower subjects of the caste system to internalize their fate as subordinated. Redemption and liberation are severely constricted. So they try to make it through by partially following the rules to get by. Thus in America, the black man was captured to appease the superiority of white man. Lying and flattery of white people by black people was essentially a question of black persons, Du Bois says, a lack of faith in themselves, end quote. This came in forms such as vocation, where you go economy, sociality, and many notes of moral righteousness. The submission to the authority of white man was, not only a state question, but also a trait that was habituated in the culture of white democratic America. Therefore, Du Bois argued that freed black people contribute significantly to American society, which was a worker-oriented democracy, as opposed to the enslaved plantation economy. Thus, freedom not in law, but also in social conduct was necessary for American democracy to thrive. The subordinated caste vis-a-vis -vis the untouchables were the worst affected in America and thus the Negro was subjected to Jim Crow laws and disenfranchised from exercising citizens' rights, thereby creating in the Negro citizen a subordinated caste. That's Du Bois in uh, reference. Du Bois understood caste as a barrier of social construction that restricted access to general avenues of public realm, 
he said it is a social caste. And Du Bois seems to be inherently interested in exploring the status of subject of statehood. The secret status of one's caste described race-alike situations where the whiteness of color determined supremacy. The designs of castes were such that it animated Du Bois's intellectual radicalism. Du Bois looked at race not as an a priori, but something that had happened to a group, a heritage to slavery. This notion de-emphasized the lineage or color-based recognition of history, i.e. race. He found this concept to be evolving and unconvincing. The idea of racialized sciences gave differing results with biological traits such as anthropometry of brain and nasal indexes. This was a popular science with Du Bois was, quote, I was skeptical about brain weight, surely much dependent upon what brains were weighed. I was not sure about physical measurements and social inquiries, end quote. This led Du Bois towards the social construction of kinship, which did not consider physical trait or badge of color. A brilliant analysis. But discrimination and insults offered an important shift in the sociology of race groups. Caste was a lexicon that was already in usage among the American gentry. It received heightened attention through Charles Sumner, right here, whose statue is not far from here. In particular, 1869 speech, the question of caste. Caste-based social order manifested directly to maintain social stability for the colonial apparatus of biocontrol. Now, missionaries such as Reverend Joseph Roberts had published an account in 1847 of a Hindu convert's response to the inexcusable practices of caste in India, which produced enmity within the same classes of the Hindu religion. He emphasized the religious distinction of caste system as not merely a civil distinctions. Now, Roberts was writing from a Christian missionary's point of view and thus was perturbed by the fact that caste has penetrated into Christian institutions in India. He also, drawn, he also draws upon the energies which he compared and he said energies to libero, li, liberate Negroes from his chains also in his own country. However, after slavery was abolished, it posed serious challenge for the idea caste of work and caste of color to correspond with each other. This very correspondence of caste of work and caste of color made it possible for black slavery to continue after the abolition of slavery. It, ensla it, quote, it enslaved not only slaves, but black men who were not slaves, end quote. Nevertheless, caste system was brought back through newer forms. Political disenfranchisement uh, along with limited education to a narrower vocation and by, quote, curtailment of civil freedom of travel, association and entertainment, this is again Du Bois coming in, offered an explanation of American caste. After the abolition of slavery, society was arranged into hierarchies that was product of racialized occupation. By preferencing occupation to determine the status and rank in society, caste was instituted into what was originally meant to be a class order. In this, black and white workers did have a significant difference to climb in the same scale of hierarchy. By bringing in caste norms, the black worker was further condemned for their color and class position. For Du Bois, the color caste system meant, and I am quoting him, continuance of legal and customary race distinctions and discrimination, having to do with separation in travel, in schools, in public accommodations, in residence and in family relations. End quote. To keep the black permanently lower, it was devised, it, it devised a strategy to disenfranchise first the voters by introducing various tests. Restrictions to register, for example, was one of them. This concept of color caste was a theoretical, as a theoretical position to locate the black condition in America was continued by Du Bois throughout. In his 1947 statement that he gave uh, to the United States made an appeal to the world, a statement of denial of human rights to minorities in the case of citizens of Negro descent in the United States of America and an appeal to the United Nations for redress, that's the title, was a damning indictment of white American hypocrisy from slavery to political institutions and church that validated this discrimination. In it, Du Bois refers to the enslaved group that was brought to the United States over 16th, 17th, 18th, even 19th centuries. Irrespective of the time scale, black people in America, quote him, remained a segregated caste with restricted legal rights and many illegal disabilities, end quote. Color caste, a theme matured by Du Bois, was later developed, by his, by, was later developed concretely by his mentee, anthropologist Alison Davis, the first, I guess, the black Chicago full-time professor. 
uh, tenure professor. Davis saw color cast as the largest system addressing the complicated concepts pertaining to social castes and hierarchies of America. It prevented integration and intimate social interactions. Endogamy and negative connotation implied as a taboo upon colored groups made it quote more inviolable than the Hindu castes in India. The existing studies of the time were closely observing this phenomena in relation to the caste studies. The unchanging nature of rigid practices i.e. occupation, marriage, intimate partnership, religion were unwilling to mend or evolve made American caste system extraordinarily striking to other societies that had caste in the world. Because it received legal customary sanctions, class and caste were different because caste was unchanging due to physical birthmark assigned to individuals. Class could offer these changes easily. The category of color caste was further taken by scholars and researchers. Color and caste were essentially one and the same thing according to Gunnar Mirdal in his work An American Dilemma, a two volume work, a two volume anthology and research. Color line was another name for caste which explained the widening gulf between the castes of many classes within intra-caste groups that did not just enforce discrimination but engendered, engendered mortal conflicts. The color line of caste meant that the rule of maintaining caste was the responsibility of white group whose role was to keep the black person in their caste line and not let them think anything outside the caste injunctions. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Suraj. That was great. Um, mm -hmm. Professor Gates would like to ask the first question. I would expect nothing less. <laughs> <laughs> but before he does so, he, he's thanking you for your very kind words with which you began the session, and he's been watching all along. So um, his question is, and you may have touched upon the answer already a little bit, um, is how might the adoption of caste be put to liberators' use in the context of the race struggle in the United States? Can you repeat that question? How? Sure, yes. How might the adoption of caste, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and he has that in quotes in his question, right. be put to liberators' use in the context of the race struggle in the US? I think, you know, and this is, this is, um, this is not a once-off answer. Uh, it will be improvised. So uh, uh, don't hold me accountable for the response right yet. I'm still working on the archives. But what I noticed studying America's question through the archives of black scholars, in particular Du Bois, was his insistence on emphasizing caste. And what he really meant was that the justifications that race provided through a white perspective was not really complete to describe the situation. I mean, even for example, the work he did uh, with the Atlanta Papers, Black Reconstructions, was a study in the society and what he was taking from the, the, note, from the notes. Uh, of, and then Gunnar Mirdal comes again, Carnegie Corporation sponsored here to study the Negro problem of America. And even in there, they see that race that is clearly adduced to lineage and color, the way it was framed, was arbitrary. I mean, it didn't have a final statement on how to describe a person's descent. And caste essentially put forward that argument. And it also, I think, the, the racial struggles that we have in America, um, I'm not yet qualified enough to comment confidently about how they should, uh, what, what, what it may do. But I think um, racializing uh, a historiography of America uh, really uh, creates an incomplete picture of the permanence. The idea of black people being subordinate subjects and they have to be maintained on the lower order is maintained. And that's the caste principle. What, I mean, no matter, as they were saying, if you're, if you're a slave and if you're not, you were still a slave. And that was not just the idea of, you know, and there was another of, you know, because of time, the earliest people who came to work in America as, uh, were not slaves even, including, they were indentures as we know the history. And, and, and the earliest arrivals uh, were from, uh, uh, from, from, the, from, the, from the port of Holland who were from England. And there is a book called White Cargo and these were basically outcasts of the society, vagabonds, thieves, the women who had, uh, you know, 
who had uh, illegal relationships and all were shipped aside as, as and so America was never the kind of land of opportunity it was something that we need to discard and you know to create and so that also created what we have um, eventually as Du Bois says slavery was then a not just a local problem it was a global problem to understand and sustain this thesis. Um, you know, race, I think, became uh, uh, f uh, uh, fashionable. I mean, I mean, I think, first first thing, why did Du Bois, I mean, Du Bois didn't refute the idea of race or something, but he was not convinced the what it, what it offered. I mean, the theories that we were talking about, studying brain, and Professor Gates worked with somebody in a recent book about uh, uh, Bourdieu uh, slave documents uh, in France where people were selling. There were certain characteristics and exteriorizing of this, but it was not just here in America. It was also in India. It was also in other parts of societies where that exteriorizing happened. And so, if you look at a long chain of history, um, then the story doesn't begin in 17th century. It begins way before that. And if we can continue that connection to what it means to have a permanent subjugation, what Du Bois calls is an, 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 um, a monopoly on rights and privileges of people, or to restrict them on that. That essentially is, is, is maintaining Marxist or other theories. Uh, uh, looked at uh, a definition that was constructed within the colonial imagination. Colonization gave few categories for us to work with and you know, uh, caste is among them, race is among them. Caste basically again is, is a group of people. What du Bois says is two groups, the enslaver and the enslaved. And in that distinction you see various how your existence is, is, is related to your color, the, the color caste that you inherit. And this is a descent, then, then you are related that with certain occupation. Now, if you are doing, you know, if you are, the, the Tuskegee Institute is an effective caste institution that was creating more and more solid caste foundations. Um, yeah. I think he accepts your answer. Oh, <laughs> that's good. Okay. So okay. Thank you so much. This was uh, wonderful. I love uh, thinking about the global perspective of subjugation, and I think that's really helpful um, for modern day activists um, and young people to know that there's a global mm. role that's happening and a global history that we're all engaged in. My question is um, twofold, and it's about women. I'm wondering mm. how do women fit into Very their analysis of caste, mm -hmm. and are there other women intellectuals of the era Correct. that talk about caste as well, and how can that inform the perspective? Thank you, Alexander. Very important question. They do, and they do will feature in my book. So Catherine Impe, for example, uh, was a abolitionist. She started a journal called Anti-Caste in, 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 in UK. Uh, some play that I'm missing, and 1860s, 70s, uh, or, or, or that era. Sorry, uh, late late 19th century, uh, and she also hosted Ida B. Wells, and you know they were trying to figure out she had come to Philadelphia, and they you know and so so there is some intervention also on behalf of Ida B. Wells, but in my research so far, I've not come across a concrete formulation as a theoretical position, or not. Or, get rid of that sociological definition of theoretical. But even, uh, you know, so, so a journal called Anti-Caste uh, was published in UK and was circulated. Uh, its position was abolition. So it looked at caste, but it was trying to abolish. Abolition as in, you know, abolition of, of slavery and emancipation of, 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 of slaves. In that sense, um, of that time, the notion of gender was located as a subordinate subject of the subject. It was, it, was, it was not only looked up as, you know. Uh, so, in the initial days, women as a labor, uh, and this you can see in indenture archives. Indenture archives gives us more hint how much they were paid. The idea of labor and body is very uh, crucial in, in this uh, imperial project. And we see there is a stark difference. Uh, uh, and, and why was that? Uh, because, uh, you know, uh, the colonial fear uh, was if they get pregnant. Uh, will have to nurse them and when they are pregnant they will not be able to contribute uh, for that many months and then they have to rear the child and who is going to take responsibility. I and mean, yet down the line that was valued because now the men were always coming you know single and, and, and so forth. But also in the, in, the, in the original maxim of I don't know 16th century if I have to think it in that century 
uh, the women and men, especially coming from the European side, I don't think there was a stark difference. I mean, these were considered like, you know, you have to go and work uh, uh, on, on, on the plantation. The color ascription becomes solidified only uh, to uh, color as relation with occupation and occupation then becomes status, which is basically a caste, is, is necess it, it eventually becomes when uh, hierarchies are put in place. Um, and caste is hierarchy. It's, it's, it's what bracket of uh, this hierarchy you belong to. And then they created that hierarchy. And as caste was improvised, the subjugation of black person became codified in that caste. And that's why even after emancipation, he or she, they were still in the lower caste position. Now, if caste was not there, and let's say if only color and, and, and race, uh, race and class worked, now, class offered mobility. You could get mobility. You could become working class and stuff. But the question is, why did it not happen in America? Especially post-bellum, they were artisanal, they were skills, and they were all of that. They remained confined to a certain status that was conditioned that a black person is belonging to this caste status. And, and it, was not, it was not open to be improvised. I mean, that's why, you know, the, the, uh, the burning down of Black Wall Street. Uh, so the idea of, of refusing that was to not give that recognition of a superior or equal status. It was always meant to be subject. So, so this is happening 19th century at least onwards. And the archive of caste in America dates in 1700s. We can read about it in, 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 in the American newspapers. Hi, thank you. Um, that was a fascinating presentation. Thank and you. it's it's wonderful just to think about Du Bois writing in this kind of like broader intellectual genealogy. Yeah. I really appreciated that. I had a similar question about gender. And I was just thinking about the turn in Du Boisian studies to really think deeply about Du Bois's connection to women intellectuals, Correct. the influence of black women's thought on Du Bois's thought. And so I'm wondering, are there Indian women intellectuals? Are there women intellectuals in, in these networks that shaped his thinking? Mm. Um, that would be, I, I'm curious then maybe more broadly just to think more about the intersections between gender and class and, and caste would be great to know more about. I mean, I'm, I'm just gonna give someone else's research here. It's not my research. Uh, but to appear smart, I might do it as well. <laughs> so, so Du Bois, du Bois goes to Germany, uh, you know, as a student, and there he hangs out with people, and he meets Max Weber, and he's, you know, he's he's going on a European trip, and you, you know, Du Bois is very Victorian intellectual. He likes European, and you know, he makes no uh, excuse about it. His uh, his his love for that, and so when he's going there, there is a colored people's conference, if I'm not mistaken. It's colored people or African, uh, Asian, uh, uh, Asian. American, Asian African kind of solidarity, that's uh, a meeting is taking place. And there, um, uh, now it is said, the, the scholar argues, uh, uh, Homi Baba argues, that uh, this, there was a rich Parsi woman from India. Parsis were the exiled people from uh, Iran who had come. And she had settled in Europe and she hosted like a small salon for a few of these radicals. And also she gave a presentation at one of these conferences, which was widely reported uh, in Europe. And so he said, Du Bois saw that woman and Skip Gates asked him, did he sleep with her? I mean, that, that's, the, that's the relation of that kind of intimacy as opposed to what intellectual production is. What, what that did was to create, can a woman intellectual sphere exist? And, and according to Homi Baba in his research says that that woman became a kernel of his novel that he wrote, The Dark Princess. And Dark Princess is basically, uh, and you know, it's, 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 it's built with a lot of stereotypes and so on. But we know one person for sure that he was actively engaged with was Lala Lajpat Rai, was another Indian nationalist who had come here. And he and Du Bois toured somewhere. They gave talks. Uh, and, and Du Bois was, I mean, he sent few people his manuscript, which is a generous thing to do, right? But sending manuscript to review and, you know. So because he was covering so much of a, a different graph, he sent the... Uh, draft to Lala Lajpat Rai, one of that, and say, hey man, give me comments on this, because I'm including India. Um, and we don't know if Lala Lajpat Rai responded yet, but we have the correspondence of him uh, sending it to them. And Du Bois was vice versa, educating Lala Lajpat Rai about here. And so he wrote a book, uh, Lala Lajpat Rai was an interesting guy. He wrote also a book about the Hindu's experience in America, something like that, there is a book. And then he also talks about the caste question. And so he says, uh, the Indian uh, people are like the black people of America. 
and Ambedkar goes nuts. And Ambedkar wrote, uh, writes a, a rejoinder, which is titled uh, Slavery or Untouchability, which is worse. And then he explains, because again, you see, Lala Ashputra was also from dominant caste. He was a Baniya, uh, not Baniya, um, I think it was Baniya, Lala's. And, and, and he, somebody, uh, you know, had access to America and so forth. So what they were essentially was happening during that time was the Indian freedom struggle was looking itself as a colorized nation. Same way Du Bois, Malcolm X and so forth struggles were looking at each other as a colorized against the white European hegemony. But people like Du Bois and Ambedkar were thinking much more deeper than that. They were not just ascribing it to what it means to colored solidarity, though Du Bois participated actively into this struggle. For Du Bois or Ambedkar in this sense was to look at what it means to have an internal problem of societies. And Fanon, which has become an important, talks about the national majorities, talks about what it means to create new elite, post-colonial elite. So long story short, there is that reference. Um, I don't know from Indian side, I just know this example and, and my reading, I think, in that direction has to be important. So far, that's the only information I have. Thank you for your words, particularly the human aspect of what you shared. A very brief general comment and then a question. I think all races have their superior aspects. Mm -hmm. Every race is superior to the others, if we might keep that in mind. But my question is, yeah. I want to bring you some words from an old friend and neighbor, Ralph Waldo Emerson. I'm the founder of the Center for American Studies in Concord. And Emerson wrote very briefly, it is a secret of the world that all things subsist and do not die, but only retire a little from sight and afterwards return again. Nothing is dead. Mm. Men feign themselves dead and endure mock funerals and mournful obituaries. And there they stand, looking out the window sound and well in some new and strange disguise. So this is the Emerson of the American Scholar Address, of the Divinity School Address. But my question is this, if at the end of our life we haven't fulfilled our full potential, if there's more we can learn, more we can give, and if the poet Robert Frost knew what he was saying when he said, Earth is the right place for love, in this notion that Emerson presents us of reincarnation, which human to human, like unto like, which the great souls of the ages have recognized, it's gone out of fashion today, we've lost sight of it. But if that's the case, and if we're striving to become whole, full, complete human beings, could it be in one lifetime we're black, the next white, one male, the next female, one Christian, the next Jewish, in order to become whole, complete, hmm. full, and human beings. Might this be a cornerstone for a new art and practice of race? Racism, like consumerism, like industrialism, like communism, means nothing more than the art and practice of, the art and practice, a new art and practice of race. I think that was a comment, I think, um I wonder if that makes sense, this notion that reincarnation provides perhaps a key mm. for looking anew at the race issue. And I just add briefly, That's I've said to some white friends of mine who out of lack of exposure, thus who prejudge, thus who are prejudicial, how would they feel if in their last lifetime it turned out they were black or the next, oh, that's, that's. or the next, they were to become black. That is. <laughs> and once one hears such a notion, you can never think about the race issue in the same way. I think this this applies to Indian caste context because the whole entire paradigm is fixed on reincarnation about your past karmas. Yeah. One of the explanation is you became this because you have done something in the past karma. Then a plausible definition also comes in metaphysics of different trains in India. I have never thought that. In this context, actually, and that's, you know, it opens up a, a, a very good uh, speculative imagination of what that would do. Because let's say if America was a Buddhist country, not a Christian country, what it would mean? I think you know, one has to write a paper about it, what, what it would mean to have a certain spiritual practice uh, that, uh, that thinks about 
reincarnation, rebirth, about locating your good deeds in the past and bad deeds. But you know what that does and something that I'm finding very unsettling is that it rationalizes the subjugation of people who are born now. And there's no freedom. That's why I become Marxist for a moment when this comes. Even Leninist for a moment. You know what I mean? Because, you know, there is no, you know, a people with privilege will justify their position for doing something in the wrong. Um, but I think reincarnation would work when the privileged people relinquish their privilege to give opportunities to the oppressed. And I think that idea will work then. In, I mean, you know, this Judeo-Christian myth of American society, that way it, it performs itself, is very much based on the Christianized notion of charity, what it does to do good. But it never internalizes the reincarnative aspect of that. Um, I mean, you know, let's say if, if, if this was uh, a Hindu or Buddhist country or whatnot, one would try to find the uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson in somebody's life. Uh, and and it, would, it would create a very complex way of society. So I think that's a very interesting, I've never heard that. And thank you for your uh, uh, thought on that part. Uh, thank you for your Probably thoughtful presentation. Uh, my question is also religion. Um, I'm not very familiar with the history of the caste system in India, but as far as I know, I know it's based in a deep rooted millenary tradition that goes back to the sacred text, like the Vedas and, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And that tradition has centuries of, uh, even thousands of years mm -hmm. existing by the time the Europeans arrived to India. In Europe, Christianity has a different tradition in which the case system doesn't have exactly the same place. Correct. So my question would be, when you take religion into consideration, do you think that that explains that uh, in the long term, in this big uh, vision of history, the caste system, if it actually existed in America, in the whole continent, actually never took off and was social lasted. It has to do anything to do with religion, with the fact that the Christianity has a different foundations than uh, Hindu religions. And if that's the case, how you can incorporate mm. the religious aspect into this secular, post enlightened version, post colonial version of the past? Very brilliant question. See, I think what we do, we wrestle with understanding today's society is by looking at three, maximum 400 years of human experience. The human history that we locate to confine our own existence is to look at three to 400 years of what has happened in the past. And one of the major influences comes with the idea of travel, migration, mobility, which, which, it, which brought many forms of um, architectures of control. Colonization is one of that, but not the only one. There are many forms of uh, uh, traits that existed. Why does colonization become a central thesis? Is because the idea of modern state was coming into formation. Uh, slavery was not unique. Slavery was existing in the Arab world. I mean, the Berbs were very uh, 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 radical people. And, and when you see uh, the Africa, African uh, uh, tribal societies were deeply cast. They were deep, I mean, when you enslave somebody, and this was not just in India too, you know, the idea of other, the, uh, the Arya and Arya was again the idea of master and slave. So this phenomenon, and Du Bois is aware of that, you know, but he has to make an argument for a white supreme, against white supremacy. So he brings the relative history to bearing, but he's also not a blindfolded follower. So what happens when we construct a modern nation state, the elites who are holding the position of power, they define the contours of history and nation state. Fanon is against that. Fenard is strongly pushing back whenever he gets a chance. Steve Biko in Af South Africa also does that, the fear of post-colonial. And how does religion manifest in this? And I think, you know, um, Iberia is a very good that region to understand what we see today. Because these two concepts, rasas and castas, really become prominent. And we know uh, the British were not the earliest. These were Spaniards and the Portuguese who were traveling the world afar. And you can see this in the tribal writing of the Marco Polo and so forth. And there are many Portuguese texts and Spanish texts written of that time who would look at their own societies and then project that into other societies. That's why Latin American caste question is there too. Edgy Ward has written a book on Mexico and there's also idea of various subgroups. The definition of caste don't exist in Brazil, but if you look at the, uh, the census collection of data, that is right up preferring and preferencing what caste one belongs to. And, and in many ways, the Abrahamic faith was itself uh, 
conscious of various group centrism, the groups that existed. And groups are nothing but the kind of idea of tribalism. And so you, you ask this question, why were the Jews and the Moors, the Muslims, are excluded from a Catholic? It's, it was only when the, uh, when the Vatican, the Catholic provenance takes uh, over and, and uh, over the Iberian uh, region and, and they start to create these new laws. And then that becomes a kind of hallmark. I'm also interested in what happens before that. I'm interested in like, why do I give a wholesome uh, uh, credit uh, to a model colonial apparatus that has defined my existence now? I mean, I can exist beyond their imagination of what they describe me as. It could be anything. It could be colorized, it could be caste. But I, wanna, I don't want to center the agency of two or three hundred years of colonization, which is very significant. It is important. We need to take into account. But also, we don't need to make it a wholesome project of understanding our existence. We can take it as part of it. But there is much more story. I mean, you know, one of the classic stories of the West African slaves, mostly Senegal and Nigeria, who were exported. And the people who were capturing there was already an existing trade. And this was a caste system in Nigeria, as we know, the, the people from the different tribes. And they were caste systems. And there is an Osu caste system there. And a scholar, Ugo, who is at Berkeley, argues that the people who were enslaved and sent uh, uh, forward were already subjugated in their own regions. So it was not the, uh, the people with their where vital from Africa that could remain. These were already subordinated. These were captured people. These were people who were already attacked and subjugated. And this was an easy labor. Either they will enslave themselves, but this ensla exporting the uh, enslaved to a, a different continent was profitable. So that's how it began. And, and we know that these systems that existed in Africa or India and elsewhere was the creation of its own societies that can hold on to certain prestige and power. And I think this is what continues in the identification of modern apparatus of, of slavery. Um, first of all, this is a great talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm wondering, my interests align a lot with racial subjugation at the meso level. So I'm wondering, how can we compare caste subjugation across different types of stigmatized spaces, so like mm. a black neighborhood? versus a um, predominantly untouchable community. Mm. And then also, like, how can we compare how people in these spaces reckon with the stigmatization of where they live? Oh, this is a brilliant question. The idea of stigma. So again, you know, one of the things we need to do is we need to be a little bit sociologist when you we, when we approach caste question. We don't have to be uh, only uh, teleological. Uh, caste in, in, in a social uh, uh, configuration uh, works in the way of, there are few para parameters. The legal system is, is, is encouraging such form of division, which, which happens. Jim Crow was one of them. There is a ritual and moral sanction of society for the, for the, for the existence of the system. where, And there is a stigmatization. And you cannot change your caste when you are born into it. You become a caste into it. One of the features of caste system as opposed to a class system is it's a permanent identity. You take it from your mother's womb. And your mother's womb is what defining what caste of society you belong to. Now, if you um, uh, um, Che Kanta Dio, for example, writes about this uh, in, in, in a very different context. And of course, he's writing in the, as, a, as, as a writer or through in the colonial times. He's looking at Senegal, the griot, for example, how, how they function. I mean, in, in a Senegambian region, again, uh, is, is engaged with, with this kind of identifying markers. Now, if you go to uh, I mean, I wrote this paper, Global Caste, and the various categories on the Horn of Africa, Somalian society or Ethiopian society carries those caste identifiers. And I was, I remember still this conversation uh, with a Malian preceptor of language who was at the Department of FM Studies. I asked him, because Mali also has this strict caste systems, and he said there were like four or five hierarchies of caste systems, and they pretty much not exactly, but they had those hierarchies in place, the privileged and so forth. And I, say, I asked him what caste you belong to. He was somewhere in the middle, not the lowest. And then there was a, what they call servant caste. I said, what happens if a servant caste meets you in America? He said, I will expect him to be my servant also in America. So, 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 so and, 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 and because the normalization of the stigma that you see in what location you belong to. And you see, segregation is one thing. Domination is one thing. You see, now when you are segregated and dominated at the same time, you have very little space to advocate for anything. It's like, you know, you are there and you are dominated, you are controlled, your resources are confined. So 
you really have to, what Du Bois says, you have to get by, you have to live your life. You cannot rebel open day and out and, 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 and have resources. And that's why one of the complicity they say of working class is to support the uh, tormentor. I mean, they have no other options. What can they do? They have to get by. And this is the condition also that has the, what he calls psychological morality in this situation. Thank you so much for this wonderful, wonderful talk. Um, two related questions that flow together. One, it, so you've provided a great what, so I'm understanding the what quite well, hopefully. <laughs> um, I'm a so what person, so I'm mm -hmm. trying to understand for the people who either individuals or country to, to transition to caste versus racism, how ah. can that be helpful for us as individuals or for the Correct. country to, to use that terminology, mm -hmm. particularly if there are folks who refuse to acknowledge that racism is at work? So, so how can caste ah. either be better for us to mm. understand? Mm. And then again, relate it, how does that help us to then intervene? So what have we learned in other caste systems that can teach us how to, to break these that's silos. Really, that's, that's a brilliant question. So first thing, I think, you know, again, um, it will take, you know, and I hope to organize a seminar for us to come and discuss these ideas. Because, um, because, you know, what we need to do is we need to go back to some of the historical records in our own research and come up, I mean, you know, let, let's think about what it means in this context. Now, as I said, the colonial experimentation of whatever few centuries that we have witnessed have given us this solid concrete formation of society. Um, and this is based on color and, and majority of that is it translated, excuse me, into racism. Civil Rights Act or anti-colonial struggles around the world created this identity. So we don't have to, let's say, uh, exclude the notion of color from this. Du Bois is talking about color caste, for example because there is a color that prefixes what your caste situation is going to be in America. In other societies, it's tribal caste, it's tribalism that works. And, and caste in this sense, again, is to, is to reiterate the importance of uh, permanency in that status. Now, you might, you might wiggle here and there, but you might never be that person, or you might never be this person. You, know, you might have a, what you call you know, intra-group mobility, but you will never have a obvious mobility because your color caste is already defining you. And the idea of police shooting is, is a classic example of uh, utilizing force, the violence to maintain the system. Because if there is no violence, you can't regulate the system. Because everybody will start claiming their own uh, uh, identifiers. Everybody will start claiming their own uh, uh, notions of existence. So you have to execute violence. And sometimes it's direct brutal violence and sometimes it's indirect violence. They do it by your crediting, they do you by uh, redlining, they do, they do many forms of things. And every time you see the system as a state is working over time to ensure caste system exists. And Du Bois is also thinking about that. And how do they do that? By political system, by schools, by courts. And we might see that it as a democratic experiment, we have a representation and all. That's all, pardon my French, bull's crap. The whole idea of uh, uh, diversity and, and representation keeps the subjugated still at the bottom. It doesn't provide the liberatory dynamics to that person. So what we essentially do is we, 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 we reference, oh, there is a representation in Supreme Court. But the caste system is owned by the groups. We have a category here called Boston Brahmins, if you know that. Who are these? You cannot penetrate into this group. You, you have to be Kennedy or John Kerry's and so forth. And you have their clubs here. I went to one of them. I was invited to just. And you can see how the colonial 17th century imagination of wealth is, is, is located. You don't have access to that, no matter how white you become. And I was taken by an Italian white person to that. And he said they never accept me uh, into, into, into this club, although you know I am sort of white. That itself is a manifestation of caste. And what it does is we need subgroup identities. When we create subgroup identities, we try to level up with what it means. So now what we have, America specifically has a category of nation-based racial markers. I think now they're improving Asian, uh, African, African-American, and, and so forth. There is also qualitative difference to that. You know, Du Bois may call, identify himself with the Egyptian uh, but Egyptians don't want to identify with the African experience. They, they, they were like, you know, keep us away from that. Uh, but if you look at what that qualitative history does to our experience, 
I think we need to prefix that. That happens in Latin America. And you have to understand, caste is a fixed hierarchy of society that regulates the function of what ritually and what status one provides. There is no reason for black churches to exist separately. Ritually, that segregation does exist and there is some comfort and whatnot, but that is what the classic case of caste is. Sorry, anybody can ask you. Oh, okay. You've been very attentive. Oh, thank you. Uh, well, thank you, Siraj. Um, this is just a question and uh, that's, I guess, coming from the wonderful questions that have been asked and your wonderful presentation of, um, you know, new, recent, more recent movements of like reclamation, particularly mm. to reclaim like even derogatory terminology, like derogatory words, or just you know, ling the, the linguistic functions mm. like of these systems. Like so, for instance, like the label of being Dalit, for mm, instance, mm. that like movement from that as a derogatory word to one of like owning the term, mm -hmm. so to speak. Um, I think in like the queer rights movement, LGBTQ movement, yeah. like in particular we see like the reclamation of the word queer as like not only a positive identification but like reclaiming the word and like positive ownership of it and like identification with it. So I'm thinking about like how have you seen is the, because I I don't know, you mm -hmm. know, this word. How have you has there been movement across Dr. Bedkar's mm -hmm. work onward to like I guess in terms of the there's the systems and the ideology, right, which mm -hmm. you've spoken extensively about, in terms of even like the terminology and the, the, identi the linguistic identity pieces. Have there been any, any shifts or changes over time of those terms, and particularly for people themselves to whom they apply? Oh, you mean the categories? Like the, t the word Dalit, uh -huh. like even the word caste. Uh, is it, you, you're asking, is it like people are uh, like, self-identifying? Self peop yeah, self-identifying as that. See, this is the interesting thing, and this applies to the, uh, the, the lack of self-assertion. But this is not the case with what it means to be here. The, the black identity was once upon a time stigmatizing. It, it took, took black as beautiful, and, yeah. and you know, it took several years and decades of work. Crisis would put the photo of a black woman on, and, you know, mostly and to demonstrate that. So there is still a stigma. This applies to Roma groups as well, the Roma population, who don't want to be recognized as Roma, and so there are many Romans around who, who, will, uh, who will stick away. But as goes with you know, any popular movements, where there is a currency uh, to what you ascribe to, there will be people adding to that. And you know, we have here Elizabeth Warren talking about her indigenous roots and so forth to create that agency. But if that, if let's say if it was, if you're indigenous, you are shot dead. I don't think Elizabeth Warren would claim her indigenous identity out in public. It provides a certain status, and you know, Charity was talking about those activists who come occasionally and 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 take. Uh, I think this is what we are noticing, and the self-identification of Dalit as a program has not taken it, taken up yet. It's people like me and few of us who claim it because you know we want to have this position strongly. But interestingly, on that point, Howard Thurman or Martin Luther King Jr., either of the stories conflict, when they went to India, South India, they were introduced. They went to a Dalit school, and they were introduced as the Untouchable of America. And, and, and MLK was pissed. He's like, I'm not untouchable. And then he came, he comes and he thinks, and he said, in many ways I am. I'm segregated. I cannot marry the person I want to. And you know, he's putting out those injunctions. So Jim Crow laws that had matured slavery into legal injunctions was essentially what caste regulations were. And every time caste is legalized. There is nothing illegal about practicing caste. You do something, oh, it's in law. You, you cannot segregate. Well, this is in law. I mean, this is better for it. And, and I think this is why um, the new directory, to going back to Renee's question about uh, uh, what can we learn from other societies, is to you know, also have an inventory. Because I will tell you, the race program is universalizes, but it rejects the many subtle subordinate identities. And you know, I'm hanging out with my friends and so forth, and you know, there's solidarity and stuff like that. But I'm more concerned about what is the working class poor person on the field doing? What's his or her status? And very rarely at all we come across those subordinated masses from these geographies. We might have black, brown, whatever color, but we still carry the historical inherited caste privilege.
that advantages us to go further. But what about those societies? And you might be anybody from any society. That's why we need that caste question to address the most bottom. Or else you make them a, de a development studies project, go and do something in there, and go to African villages, go to Indian villages and do something, you know, without totally understanding what these refined identities mean. I will do quick, yeah. Hi. Thank you, Suraj, for Thank you, this brilliant discourse and opening this uh, interrogation about, uh, you know, this broad category that seems to be. And, you know, philosophically thinking, race and class, one can think they're existential, but caste becomes ontological. Mm. And, mm. uh, for example, 99% of Sanskrit texts, caste is an ontological category. It's not existential. <coughs> and mm. construction of quote-unquote Hindu religion is actually in 19th century <coughs> to hide this so it can become part of the you know, like a national project of the upper caste and liberal, what lack of other term, a local bourgeoisie. Mm -hmm. So like Raj Patra you mentioned, who was from my village, by the way. Okay. <laughs> he argues, I'm not a Hindu, I'm a Brahmin. Mm. And if you read Manoj Mehta's book, The Caste Pride, mm -hmm. So he has documented like hundreds of cases in which this dichotomy goes on. You know, they say we are not Hindus, we are Brahmins, and this. So that may be something to look into That's in this ontological That's notion of caste. And by the way, that uh, your Parsi woman in Europe, she was Madam Kama. Madam Bhakaji Kama. Uh, and uh, she was part of Afro Asian Solidarity. Afro-Asian Solidarity. Solidarity <laughs> group. You. And, you know, like Gadar Party. He was one of the leaders of the Gadar Party. Oh, wow. Yeah, in Europe, yeah. Well, thank you very much for really no, brilliant I, presentation. I appreciate it, I appreciate it. Yes, um, thank you, thank you so much. Um, I'm reeling in a lot of things, um, but specifically, my question comes specifically with the context of black people in the United States, but I think it can be expounded. Um, how do you think it's valuable to try to disconnect our understanding of caste and symbols from our relation to labor and work hmm. right because in the in the United States when you have class we have groups of black people who make a lot of money right um it can obscure the reality that there is a, a a caste in the way you're mm -hmm. arguing. So, but most of our arguments are based on this idea of racial capitalism mm, mm, that mm. connects work mm. to class status. So how do you think it, or understanding the, because I hear you talking about social societies and social positions that regardless of economic gains still exist. So how do we, how do we make that distinction? Correct. To acknowledge, because my first question was, sure. if it's if you can't move up and down caste, how do you make sense of people who pass for white mm. or black people who have a lot of money? Because mm. ideally, you would think, no, they've made it. Mm. But when you think of caste not as tied to economics, so I think it gives us a, a, another way yeah. to make a, an argument. Beautiful. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. I think. Thank you. And thank you, Jasparji, for both of these questions. I'll just take her quickly, and then I think you know this is what you know. There's so much uh, to unpack there, uh, but let's say if we, um, racial capitalism for example, you know, great concept, again, privilege is the idea of nation, privilege is the idea of, it, it, doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't bring in the idea of people or group, it, it creates an archetype of what it means to be us versus them, but not in the sense of us as in group, us as in collective. Now racialized cap, I mean, you know, this makes sense to understand the hegemony of white people. Racialized capitalism would not necessarily say non-white racialized capitalism. 
it would not say the hegemony of let's say Indian businesses now taking over African or Chinese taking over. I mean, how do you put that in what context? And and so the so the other rising that we see that we see in East Africa or in this sense, where a, a, a nation as a representative category. In modern sense, we need that identity, without which we cannot exist. I mean, you know, we have the passport or, you know, it's a monopoly on your labor, your taxes that the nation wants to collect. And that's basically the reason. So we are, by default, an economic actor in our existence. We cannot differentiate ourselves from that. You are existing, you are paying tax. You are running the state. You are not just paying a tax on your income, you are paying the tax, indirect taxes. And India has many, come to India and, and just spend, you'll become poor. So, so, so this idea of economism attached to the bio po uh, body politic of an individual has also to do with what social status they come from. Now, let's say a black person becoming billionaire, whatever, right? Now, the point is, it's relative to what? So we have to always look at caste in relation to other caste groups. And so the mixed uh, color people and so forth. In Africa, they form a different category word and then they form here. So if it is about racialism, then it should apply the same logic there as and here as well, right? There you, I think you 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 call them colored. In America, you call something else. Uh, in in French, you know there is a different meaning of 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 this. Whereas what caste does is it 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 provides us a rationale. Now it it it, it rational cannot be a rationalization, but a rationale to our senses and to be very. I mean this is a great to the ontology of a society. Where does society function? How does it function? Now, let's say uh, you and I made it, right? And X, Y, Z. But our caste position is so strong that you cannot disassociate. The moment they arrest you or the moment you do anything, the first thing they're looking for is your background. Locating your, your, your caste, <laughs> what caste you belong to. You might be uh, uh, Oprah Winfrey shopping in Switzerland, but the, the idea of caste is still existing because, you know, we want to know what's your story. Uh, we see people, you know, uh, uh, shopping the African elites or Arab elites shopping in uh, in Europe and all. What racialized categories do they belong to? Because the Arab people, especially the UAE and the developed countries, are extremely toxic in their behavior of other so-called racialized solidarities. So what we need to then uphold in our analysis of this is looking at caste not just as a static institution, it's very active institution. You carry your caste, and, and again I'm saying, it's not just groups, it is what you carry as individual. Your individuality is your caste, and, and you essentially belong to a group. You, you, you know, and caste is basically extended kinship, and Du Bois talks about it. If you go in any village in many parts of the world, the kinship is a very solid foundation of how you organize groups, celebrate and, and do festivals. Similarly here, the modern kinship and so forth. And I think one of the mistakes the European sociologists did in the early 20th century, Franz Boas and Harlewell Merskowitz and so forth, was did not bring that analysis. They called it different identities but caste because I think the question of their own caste would have come. Whiteness provided a, a protocol for anybody but anybody non, uh, anybody white. And anybody whiteness is so arbitrary it could mean many things. In India, we call North Indian white people. We call them Gore, you know, because they are light in color. And, and so, this manifestation within American society or any other society has to do with, I think, the group and individual affirmation. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.